Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., where we are with Andrew Philip Hunter, who is the director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Vago. Um, Want to start off first? Um, you put out a report this week on Monday, uh, as I recall, on international armaments cooperation. Uh, what's the point you guys were trying to make with that report? Well, there's a couple of points we're trying to make in the, in the report. Uh, one that is natural is uh, international joint development cooperation hasn't really been in vogue lately. So we're making the point that it's still important, it's still necessary, and it's still critical. But the second point that we're making is it's still incredibly hard. Uh, and it's harder than doing regular acquisition, which is already hard. Uh, and so what we tried to focus on is some best practices that can make it uh, as successful as you can when you get into one of those programs. And so what are some of those? Because obviously you were in the acquisition game in the Obama administration. You were part of uh, the team that was trying to get as much equipment as rapidly fielded as possible, and you guys were looking at global sources for that. What are some of the key lessons in order to do a good international program from your standpoint? Well, one of the key lessons of our report is, is the need for balance. Uh, there's a lot of different priorities that go into nations working together in acquisition. There's a lot of different priorities in regular acquisition, even more so in the international context. Uh, and one of the lessons is, you know, you, you really have to get a, a lot of small wins to make international acquisition work, uh, rather than trying to go for one big win. Let me ask you about the budget. Um, obviously, uh, General Mattis, uh, Secretary Mattis now, put out a budget guidance today. What does it mean? Well, uh, it means there's a heck of a lot of budget work that's about to go on. Uh, they're putting out a 17 budget that's revised from the budget that's currently on the Hill and awaiting enactment now that we're almost six months into the fiscal year. Uh, they're putting out a revised 18 budget, uh, revised from what was handed to them by the outgoing team and, and Ash Carter and his team. Uh, and they're putting together a defense strategy and a budget plan long term that's supposed to support that strategy. Uh, so just about an almost four years worth of budgeting activity is going to get crunched down into the next year, and it's a good time not to be at the Pentagon. <laughs> you guys have a crack uh, team of budget experts here. Obviously, Todd Harrison is here. Mark Kansian is here. You're here. You've had a little bit of budget scarring as well over the years. Um, you know, there's an overwhelming sense that uh, this budget uh, period will not be exactly like the Reagan buildup. There are some folks who are saying that there's going to be two years of upside and gird yourself that there might not be as much money as folks uh, hope that there is going to be. What are some of the projections that you guys are looking at as to what 17, 18, and 19 look like? Well, having several budget experts usually means having several budget opinions, and that's uh, true here as in elsewhere. I'll speak for myself, but uh, I, I still believe that uh, the upside here is probably a little less than people are anticipating. Uh, we still have this thing called the Budget Control Act, uh, and the trick there is that it takes 60 votes uh, in the United States Senate to change the, the budget caps. Uh, what does that mean? That means you've got to get at least eight Democrats to support any change. That means in order to increase defense spending, you have to also increase domestic spending. And I think that puts a limit on how high you can go. doesn't mean it can't be done, uh, but it puts an inherent limit on how much extra defense spending uh, they're going to be able to get. Uh, then the question is, within that increase, whatever it ends up being, how much of that goes for the different priorities, readiness, capacity, modernization. Uh, and that's not really clear yet. And um, when you look at how many years, um, is this going to be a long sustained thing or is this a short burst of money that's going to come through to get uh, some headline programs done, be able to say, hey, we ordered a bunch of ships that puts us close to 355 or a whole bunch of aircraft. The personnel part of the Army, you know, there are some who worry that by the time the Army grows, it's going to have to start cutting again. Well, and that's been a historical pattern, right? These defense budget cycles are fairly regular. When you look at the data, you know, they come about every 10, 12 years, you go from peak to trough. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if that was uh, true again here. So I would say two years for an upswing is probably too short, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's certainly not going to be endless. Five to six years is usually when you hit the peak. Uh, and uh, the peak here may not be that much higher than we are today. One of the interesting things is, even though very few of us are happy with the defense budget we have, in historical terms, it's at a reasonably high level. Where do you think the budget's gonna end up? Well, I think for this year, something in that 20 to $40 uh, billion dollar range is probably about right, uh, with a focus definitely on readiness for that first plug that's going in. Uh, then the question will be, how much can they increase in the years going forward? And actually, I think $40 billion may be a reasonable rough order of magnitude ceiling 
uh, for how much higher they can go compared to the Obama plan and or the budget caps. And then we just have a couple of years of sharp up and then more of a plateauing general rise is gentle rise is what you see. Yes, exactly. And but what happens? I mean, we haven't the administration hasn't yet given guidance. Right. And Mick Mulvaney is going to be the budget director. And he was one of the reasons why we have a Budget Control Act in the first place. How uh, receptive is he going to be to jack up the debt as high as it's going to go up potentially by another ten trillion dollars, which is something that Republicans have will, been willing to shut the government down over? Well, that is the sixty four billion dollar question for defense <laughs> and everybody else. Uh, I think certainly in the case of Mulvaney, uh, he's not going to be willing to go for more, and he's clearly got his sights set on OCO. Uh, and to the extent there's any hope to go higher than those, those funding levels I mentioned, he would have to be in the OCO account. He's going to work to stop that by hook or by crook. Uh, you know, it's really hard for me to gauge with, with the overall deficit levels what's likely to happen, because we've seen deficits explode in the past, and frankly, Congress hasn't really done much to stop it as long as it was their team that was in control and driving where the money was going. So uh, I'm less sure that there's going to be a huge backlash on deficits per se, uh, but I think there still will be a lot of fighting to be done on discretionary spending. One of the other things I want to ask you about is the implications of the President's America First strategy. He wants to buy American, build American. Uh, great sentiment, but the entire American defense industrial complex is actually globalized. Canada is a key part of it. Mexico is a key part of it. Uh, our allies, NATO allies, you know, Buy American exists on the books, but almost everything is waived. You know, you used to be somebody who was dealing with all of this stuff, and I think that people underestimate the importance of foreign systems, whether it was Israeli armor or British or French electronic warfare gear, or even MRAPs originally were of South African and British design. What are the implications of this on the defense, on, on, on achieving the most defense bang for the buck? Well, the implications are, are quite large. Uh, I should start by saying, you know, really the defense industry is an all-star when it comes to manufacturing in the United States. Uh, their uh, percentage of jobs that are in the U.S., the amount of, uh, of the revenue that's going to U.S. content is huge, uh, outpacing almost any other industry you could think of. So this is an industry where America first is what we're actually doing. Uh, however, as you point out, uh, there is no supply chain on this green earth that is not global in nature. And that's true for aerospace and defense as well. Uh, which kind of brings me back to where we started, our, our report on joint development. Uh, it, is, uh, it is true that the systems that we develop, in most cases, hopefully, a lot of the revenue is going to ultimately come from working with international partners. And if we try to go for a big win, if we try to make uh, the, the, the benefits of these systems entirely to the U.S., we're going to miss out on all that business. And it may be 25, 30, in some cases 40 or 50 percent of the potential market or revenues for these systems. So we're really then cutting off our nose to spite our face. Andrew, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.